Well, good morning and welcome to the keynote address of the International Business Appreciation Month at the University of Missouri St. Louis. I'm Joe Rotman and I have the pleasure to serve as director of our international business program and professor of information systems and technology. And I couldn't be more excited for today's keynote. This keynote has been two years in the making at least. And so Ambassador O'Malley was our keynote speaker for our International Business Career Conference in March of 2020. And that was going to be on a Friday and we shut the campus down on Thursday because of COVID. So we're honored to be working again with the World Trade Center and Tim Nowak and mm -hmm. Ambassador O'Malley here. So today's session is live and in Zoom. It's also going to be live streamed in Facebook. And once Professor O'Malley introduces himself and his staff, and we'll have some questions between Professor O'Malley, Ambassador O'Malley, major professor, Ambassador O'Malley, and myself, and then we'll open it up to questions for anyone in the room, as well as people on Facebook or in Zoom. So this is the 14th year that we've brought faculty, staff, and students together to talk about the careers in international business and the paths that those professionals have. And I don't think uh, there's a path that's less direct than Ambassador O'Malley's path. So he is a second generation immigrant his grandparents arrived from Ireland to the United States with $20. But their passion for education made it all the way through to Ambassador O'Malley, got his law degree at St. Louis University, and went on to be a federal prosecutor prosecuting the mafia. Then went on to be a successful attorney here in St. Louis in Greensfelder. And we're honored to have him share his story with you in the, this international business appreciation. So could you please? Join me in welcoming that. Good morning. Uh, it has really been two years uh, that uh, we've been trying to pull this off. We, we stopped. We got stopped by COVID. Uh, we were stopped once by a blizzard, and uh, Vladimir Putin couldn't stop us this morning. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try to talk a little bit about Ireland. A little bit about how a St. Louis uh, born and raised uh, Irish American ends up in Dublin and the possibilities uh, and the probabilities and the opportunities that are available uh, to all of us uh, in this wonderful country called Ireland. So there is a uh, famous story I uh, told about the President John Kennedy, who was the very first American president ever to visit Ireland. He fell, he came to Ireland in 1963 and stayed at the ambassador's residence, which we'll see in a second, and um, fell in love with Ireland. He spent five days there. The Irish pulled out all the stops and were the most hospitable, uh, as they always are. And the president was already making plans to return to Ireland the following year for a second trip to enjoy the first experience. All of 2000, in the fall of 1963, Kennedy was having a drink with his uh, conversation with politics. And the, the buddy asked uh, President who he intended to endorse uh, to be the successor as president of the United States. And Kennedy, according to his story, tended to talk around for a while and just gave out some names of the prominent players and uh, the friend, the president, the lifelong friend of the president, pushed him a little bit further and said, yeah, really, who, who are you going to endorse to be your successor? And President Kennedy uh, said that he intended to endorse uh, whoever it was that would promise to nominate him to be his most successful child. That's the job that he wanted. So we're going to talk a little bit today about why why President Kennedy would want that and why I think it's, if there's a better job than being just a desk job, I have not been. So we should start maybe with this, with the swearing in. Uh, it has some, uh, some references to today. Uh, the Vice President, uh, then Vice President Biden, uh, is an Irish American, quite proud of uh, And the very first call that I got after uh, the call, they asked me to was uh, from, from vice, then Vice President Biden said, when do I swear you? And uh, which 
turned out that Vice President Biden had never been to Ireland for the Ford Center. He eventually came and stayed uh, with us at the ambassador's residence in Dublin for about a week and with his entire family. Country. We did some, uh, obviously, some speaking engagements and some things, items, but we also uh, toured where his folks were from. Um, so, uh, President Biden, who has a full plate of things uh, to worry about uh, this, this week uh, and, and for the last several months, um, really enjoyed that trip and is going to get ready for the Government of Ireland uh, more or less invades Washington around what we call St. Patrick's Day, which they call St. Patrick's Week, which is really almost St. Patrick's Month. <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture taken on St. Patrick's Day uh, in the Oval Office. Uh, it's the, the, the protocol for those of you who went through study protocol is a little out of whack. The president should be in the middle of that picture, but he pushed me in. And so it, it, there's, there's a nice uh, picture. Um, the, the Prime Minister of Ireland is the only world leader who has a guaranteed annual Oval Office meeting with the President of the United States. No other President Xi in China, uh, who is certainly not on the list we'll talk about, uh, Boris Johnson in the UK, no other world leader uh, has an open invitation to be at the White House for an Oval Office meeting. It's, um, let's go to, we'll take a quick look at some of the, that's the ambassador's residence in Dublin. Uh -huh. uh, and the reason I'm showing you this is, is to set up what we're going to talk about in a second, the love that the Irish have for the United States. This home is probably uh, one of the most luxurious in Ireland. Uh, it is called Deerfield. It sits on a 70 acre plot of beautiful land, which itself is located in the largest urban park in Europe. Uh, it was built in 1776 uh, by the British when they owned and ran Ireland before the uh, um, And when the British uh, left, uh, the Irish gave this residence to President Kennedy State, so he visited it, and Vice President Biden State, so he visited it. And every other president, President Reagan, President Nixon, all the all the state, and that's where my wife and I are going to so. outside uh, one of the official opening of it, some of the gardens that are seen. So it's used a lot for entertaining. Um, we have a lot of guests, a lot of, we used it um, for all kinds of functions, probably two or three nights a week. It was, it was not unusual to have uh, 300, 350 guests at the hotel, so reception. Uh, the house staff knows how to do that, the professionals that get it in and out before. And people from all over Dublin can see this house visible and but most people have never been in it. So we made during our time in Ireland, we made it a point to try to make sure that 20 to 25 percent of our guests list will be from many on all the So everybody has a place to see. Okay. Let's talk about Ireland just for a second. Small little country. It is about half the size of the Europe. There are four and a half million people that live in Ireland. And uh, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't uh, estimate the size or the population from um, the power that they have. The Irish are fond of saying that they punch above their weight. Uh, mm -hmm. There are 30 million Americans who claim Irish ancestry of some degree. My, my, my grandparents came to Ireland. With uh, twenty dollars, um, they also came with seven children. 
deprived of the U.S. They, they decided to take their children. And I reached out to the family, and 15 children, um, and grew up in the United States, went through the Depression, went through the war, and were very connected to their Irish heritage. And so the 30 million Americans who claim Irish ancestry, that's a, that's a big number even for the United States. Yeah. An interesting, interesting thing, and you know, this is uh, even more obvious, it's emphasized every March. Uh, the, the word claimed is the really important part of that sentence that American Irish are proud of their Irish ancestry and they claim it. It's something that they'll you know, be wearing green and have grains and all that good kind of stuff. And that's really kept our two countries pretty much together over. Um, so this is this is Ireland. Um, the, the top part, the northeastern part, the upper right hand of the map, is Northern Ireland. Uh, its history is uh, is different um, than, than, the, than the Republic of Ireland, which is the majority of that. And we'll catch that when we we'll talk about Brexit. Um, so why is it that um, we have this. We have this connection between the United States and Ireland. There is a genetic component of that, as I said, thirty million Americans who, who claim Irish ancestry to some degree. But there, there are other substantive matters that bring our countries together. Right now, as, as we speak, there are over seven hundred American companies resident in Ireland. They're the top tier of our tech industry, the top tier of our farm industry, uh, have decided to put their European headquarters in Ireland. There have, as we sit here today, there have been over $500 billion, $500 billion in American investment in this tiny island of Ireland. At the size of Missouri, with only 400, with only 4.5 million. The huge investment the United States has made uh, in a small country. Why, why did that? Why did that happen? Why? Why is? Why did the, the, the American industry decide that Ireland was a place to do this investment? For a couple of reasons, and I think they're important to understand as, as you, uh, students of uh, international commerce, uh, as people looking for opportunities as the future of our country in the U.S. First of all, and kind of important to understand this, uh, Ireland is now the only English speaking country in the European Union. The 26 countries of the European Union are now excluded. And, and the UK was part of the EU, and, and I think everybody in this room is still part of the EU, uh, never converted to the euro, which makes a big difference in international monetary transactions. With Ireland, Ireland used to be euro, and so you only tend to make your money once rather than twice from the euro to the pound. So that the dollars made it much easier just to make it use the euro. But there are other factors uh, that enter into this commercial relationship. When Ireland has a very well educated workforce, Ireland is leads the European Union in the percentage of persons who have third level degrees or college degrees. So there's no country in the EU that has a higher proportion of its young people who have college education. Um, Ireland's educational system is listed as the top, in the top 10 in the entire world. They just have a history of good education, a good education, a good educational system, and their students uh, have done well in Ireland and across the world when, when they left out. Um, Ireland has had, since the 1960s, when up until 1960, just about the time that President Kennedy made his visit in 63, Ireland was an agrarian protectionist society. Uh, there, there was no commerce, it was uh, farmers and milk and uh, beef, and that, that was really all that they did. The, the government decided to open up uh, 
to, to get to, to throw off the shackles of protectionism, uh, to, to begin attracting uh, investments, and it has been on the march ever since. So now you've, you've got government, successive governments for the last 60 years in Ireland that have been stable and very much pro business. One of the things that, that separates a small country like Ireland from a large country like ours is, and what which Ireland does so very, very well, is that they're nimble. Uh, they are able to operate and to change much more quickly. We are an aircraft carrier moving down the ocean and it's hard, it's hard to change two degrees. Ireland can change on a dime. When they see opportunity, they are they they jump on it and they can do that because they're they're small, they're pro, they're pro-business, and they Value uh, Ireland is the fastest growing economy in the year. So, um, all of these factors and, and so some, some many more contribute to why Ireland has affected so much American business. The real reason I have always said is I toured Ireland and talked about this. All, all of those reasons, English speaking, using the Europe, well educated workforce. Dynamic and, and nimble approach to pro uh, business government. But we also, in a very special way, because of the shared DNA, we just get one another. American businesses have thrived in Ireland because we understand the Irish, the Irish understand us. And so we're able to use that base in Ireland as the stepping point, the jumping off point for the largest uh, group of consumers, the largest. Market in the world to be 500 million consumers. Uh, the, the United States uses that uh, base in Ireland to jump in to Germany, uh, to, to France, to, to the other countries, and it really worked out well for us. So um, let's go to the, the next uh, slide over here. Th this is what, in many ways, this is what Brexit is about. There was a lot of strife is, uh, between the Protestant population in the north and the Catholic population in recent history. Now, this the the strife had nothing to do with Jesus. The strife had to do with bigotry. Um, xenophobia uh, and jobs. The, the Protestant population, yeah, the, the whole island, island of Ireland is, is predominantly practicing with the Jesuits. They're baptized <laughs> in the The North has been predominantly Protestant and practicing with the public faith, but, but that's, that's how they identify. So the, the strife had the, the, in, in the north, in the northern counties of Ireland, um, the, the jobs, the factories were owned by Protestants, and there was discrimination against Catholic workers. So that led out eventually to violence uh, to what the Irish, only the Irish could, could, could label that kind of terrorist activity that was brought as the troubles. Um, Gentle name, so it really was a lot of people killing one another uh, over, over jobs. That went on for a long time. In 1998, 1999, uh, the agreement was called, it, it signed on Good Friday, so it was called the Good Friday Agreements. Great Catholic Protestant. All this creek, but so the Good Friday Agreements went into effect, and the two countries entered into a peaceful time. This picture was taken during the Troubles. Uh, this is what it looked like to, at the border between the North uh, and, the, and the Republic. There would be these checkpoints um, to sort of a military endeavors and concerns about customs and the normal things that happen when you go from one country 
the north of Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom, into the Republic of Ireland, which is separate. Um, these, these posts, these customs, the stations were as targets for, um, for terrorists who were shot, bombed. And when the Good Friday Agreements went into effect in 99, these things evaporated. So today you can drive from Dublin to Belfast in about two hours, and you wouldn't know that you've crossed the border. Uh, commerce is totally uh, integrated in products that are started in, in the Republic, or finished in the North, sent back to the Republic and exported to wherever and vice versa. There, there's, it, there's no difference like Missouri and Illinois. There's just no, uh, there are different laws and commerce is, is when the When the United Kingdom left the European Union, all that changed. So when, during the during the tenancy of the EU, there, the border didn't make any difference. They were both the UK and Ireland were part of the European Union, so who cares? Uh, now, once England, once the United Kingdom left uh, the European Union, all that changed. And so the fear of the, the countries in the EU and Ireland was was uh, I think they magnificently marshaled everybody to to steer that this fear. Was that these kinds of borders would be reenacted uh, between the Republic and the North, and that the violence uh, would partly spur the violence even more? So, a lot of what you read about Brexit, a lot of the controversies have to do with how are we going to make the UK, uh, the Northern, the North, Northern Ireland part of the UK, uh, into this uh, the same sort of trading block? That they had before. Before we get before we get to the questions, I, I'd like to conclude by saying that Ireland places a great opportunity for us here in St. Louis. There are companies and enterprises that have a huge office. There is so much opportunity there. It's it, it's 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 worth studying and it's worth uh, thinking about for your own future. As to where, um, where, where, where fast moving events are occurring, where there is opportunity, and Ireland is certainly one of those places. It is, it is one of the things I was most impressed about in my years there the entrepreneurial spirit that has so overtaken the country. Um, they are like us in many ways in that they finally thrown off the shackles of failure. There was a time in Ireland where if you tried something and failed, that sort of stayed with you. It's from a village mentality. That once you, and now they've understood what we understand that the failure is a step on the road to success. And they've joined us in that. And we are, uh, our future is going to be Talk to share right. so everybody can see a little better online. You talked a lot about kind of your, your path a little bit to, to being an ambassador, but probably, I, at least I know, I don't really know what an ambassador does. So talk a little bit about the role of the ambassador. And I know that while you were ambassador, one of your jobs was to integrate the U.S. corporate um, trade with Ireland. But you had kind of a, a, a connection to St. Louis. So you helped a lot with the St. Louis. So talk a little bit about the role of the ambassador on the global stage and how you bring your local um, experience to it. So there are um, about 130 ambassadors in the United States that has 70% um, of those um, ambassadors are um, members of the State Department. They join the State Department after college. Uh, they matriculate uh, through at various jobs, living on various continents, and, and they go up the ranks and, and small percentage of members of the um, 30 percent the other group um, are people like me who had careers outside of the state department um, i was a practicing lawyer for a long time before the president just moved to Northern Ireland. Um, so that those are the two different ways to, to do the job um, depending on the country 
um, the job was very in Ireland. Uh, I spent um, the Irish embassy, the, the American embassy in Ireland has about 250 employees um, who are their boss. American ambassador is the highest ranking um, official of the government in the country. So all, all of the branches of government report to the ambassador. So there's that internal job of trying to make the representatives from the Commerce Department, the Agriculture Department, the Treasury Department, the Intelligence Community, make, make a symphony out of all of that. Um, that's one part of the job. The other part is the external part where you are the representative of the president and the country. And you want to be interacting with the, the government of the host country. I would probably see the president of Ireland lives across the street from us. So I would be seeing the American Prime Minister week and all the other ministers and all of the other diplomats from the other countries, the other ambassadors are from different countries now. And the job was to interact with them on various things from the ambassador to Ukraine. Solicitous of, uh, of uh, getting American help and aid. Uh, and that's, you know, that's just part of the dialogue people have. And it's, it's why, why diplomacy is, can be so successful is that it's on a whole bunch of different levels. It's just not, it's just not, and using that example, the American ambassador to Ireland dealing with the Irish, the American ambassador to Ireland. Irish dealing with the Ukrainian ambassador to Ireland and setting up different channels of communication and cooperation um, and problem solving. All of those sorts of things uh, make diplomacy a tool. I was try I tried to be careful not to be the Missouri ambassador to Ireland, uh, but I'm a home counter and so I wanted to, I wanted to promote um, uh, Missouri. Most most people in Ireland aren't familiar with St. Louis. So now they are, but they, they weren't. Um, one of the things, a simple thing we did was if, if, if an ambassador going overseas is allowed, believe this or not, to go to various art museums across the country and select art to bring to the residents uh, this collection. So my wife and I went around to some museums and we took only Missouri. Everybody in Ireland has read Mark Twain. So we get a bust of Mark Twain. Uh, paintings of Hannibal near the bottom, pictures of the March, uh, things like that hung all over the house. So when we would invite these people in for parties, uh, they were subliminally uh, told about Missouri. And generally, I would work in those meetings as something about uh, just a great educational systems we have here. And Companies that we have that are functioning in Ireland, how it would be much better if you were an Irish company wanting to establish um, in, in the US, how it would be much more beneficial for you to come to a place like St. Louis, uh, which has uh, a huge housing stock that's uh, it's affordable, um, that is centrally located, rather than, rather than going to Silicon Valley, where they all want to go, but Boston, where all the relatives are. Um, which is so much more expensive. Uh, you get you, 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 you fail once in Boston, as you say, in order to bust it. You, know, you get several runs uh, in order to be successful. I tried to be careful not to be the Missouri ambassador, but I am the one who's in Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, I think a lot of our students think that when, when someone has achieved the kind of success that they have, that it was a very path and you knew early on that you wanted to be a lawyer, that you wanted to be a professor. Um, but I know you started off in the seminary. And so your path was was not linear at all. So talk a little bit about the important points in your academic and your professional career where you took a left turn and it made it something that you hadn't planned on. So talk a little bit about your path. I I took a couple of left turns and, 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 a, and a right turn. So uh, General Eisenhower uh, is quoted as having said that um, 
the plan is not. And here's the guy who did D Day, the biggest invasion. Well, he was not going to talk about the biggest invasion uh, and movement of troops in the history of the planet. White Eisenhower has said, the plan is nothing. Planning is everything. And uh, I, I think those are very, that resonates with you. That you, you know, you have to be able to abandon the plan when it's not working. But always having a plan uh, is really but yeah, I started off, I was, I spent the very first part of my life studying with the priest. Um, although I, I was blessed with a phenomenal part of my past and my education. A lot of whatever it is I ended up doing at the time, but this was a cool fashion pre reform Vatican II seminary. But it, it, it worked for me. I, I really, I really loved it. It's just I wasn't going to be good at that job. So it was just um, a Getting a C in that. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, I went to law school, although I didn't, I never met a lawyer. Um, didn't have any of the family. I, I just, that to me was seemed like a continuation. Well, in some interest or something, it turned out to be right. Uh, I I practiced laws. I worked for the Justice Department, did crime prosecutions, did white collar crime, more crime prosecutions throughout the United States, did white collar crimes, did white collar crimes here. Um, but then went into private practice, essentially did did events and doctors and hospitals to insurance companies, um, and. Uh, I really didn't have a, 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 I didn't have any desire to, that, that was going to be my life. And then I don't want to make a political statement on that, but I, I wanted to talk about the president. So I continued to practice. I spent a lot of time on the road um, working for that campaign in 2007 and 2008. And um, at the end of the, at the Talk about the one. Some talk about the one inch illustration. I really didn't have much experience. I know this is a traveling one. I was quite surprised. Considered to be one of the top five hosts, UK, France, Ireland, Vatican to the Austin, China, Those are the those are some of the so and these jet these oftentimes go to wealthy people who have donated a great deal of money or who have raised a great deal of money. And I wasn't one of those. People. I was just a guy who volunteered for the campaign. I never had a, never had a paid job or, or had no title. I just was there for some reason. I looked up. So, but it was, it's a nice phone call to get. Uh, I recommend if anybody ever calls you about that, just say yes. Call <laughs> 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 and talk to the significant others, just say yes. So, Speaking of decisions and, and different points, I know you, you teach at SLU and right now in the law school and you have a, a fired class. And so you have interactions with college students, but if you think back to your college self, what kind of advice would you have had to make to yourself back then? And what kind of advice would you have for students now who are looking to maybe join the State Department or have an international career? I, I believe that there is so much opportunity out there for all of us. We live in a wonderful, wonderful country. There's so many things that are available to us. There's so many opportunities that sometimes we get confused. It's hard to make a decision. Um, it's hard to know which way to go. And, you know, sometimes the winds push. Uh, 
place that you didn't anticipate. And I never thought I was going to get involved with President of the Policy Club. It was furthest in front of me. But the winds pushed me there. And um, so I, I think that having, having a plan is a very, very good thing. Where am I going to, what, what really turns me on? What really is, and I think for me it was the law. Um, I, I was, um, was the main student, but I, I turned it up several notches in law school uh, because that I, I knew that I was learning my trade and I wanted to be good at my trade. And so I found something that excited me. I think, I think that's important because you've got. For all of you in here, you've got obviously you have talent. And the issue is where do you place that talent? And you better to place it somewhere where you have some people that are ups and downs in careers, uh, not people that tell you that their career is just one solid rocket ship up, or not telling you the truth. Uh, everybody has ups and downs, good days, bad days, sometimes bad months, sometimes bad years. But if, if you're into something that you are expressing your talents for and you're appreciated. Um, internationally, you get a little xenophobic during St. Louis. Uh, you know, when you see the, when you see the, the opportunities that are out there. So I, I would recommend everybody to do that. But I, I being an exchange student in 68, I was in the top. I just say we had these in the Russian society for Warsaw. They call it the Warsaw Act. They made it. So what's the best people in the town? They made that movie again. But that changed my life so much so that I had my my wife and I kind of when we saw that um, we have two children and uh, both of them uh, didn't have a whole lot of unrelated areas. They had to leave the United States for a year and study somewhere else. It changed their lives. Just, you just see things differently. You, you, I, I found that I, I was much more of a patriot having lived outside the U.S. Granted, I was here when I was living outside the U.S. and so you know, this is sure there are lots of nice things, but I belong here and there's so much opportunity Sure. Yeah. So, oh, you, you had mentioned uh, kind of the xenophobia that we have here in, in St. Louis, but St. Louis really has a prominent place in international trade. And I know you work with Tim and the World Trade Center that has helped, continues to help that. So, um, bring us up to speed on, on what's happening in St. Louis and the World Trade issues that we have, and how important biotech, uh, fintech, financial services, et cetera, in St. Louis, uh, the role that they have. That's yeah, and, I, I, and xenophobia is probably if I had if I could rewrite this, I probably wouldn't use that word. I, I would use that we don't think about it. xenophobic. Xenophobia is so when we get fear of, I, I don't know, I, that might be a progression from where we're at. I don't think we think about it. Um, we're a little bit too humble, um, thinking we don't have much to offer. But in fact, um, St. Louis, the World Trade Center, um, has all kinds of opportunities. Um, that the carriers of the, of the economy that are exploding, intact, uh, ag tech exploding, and things that I, I that are your future, not mine. I, I don't, um, I, I'm grappling to understand some of it, uh, where you folks are going to be experts and push people like me out of the way and, and move forward. And that's, that's the way it ought to be. Um, there, there's so much that you could do a whole course in the opportunities. That are available if you think about it. And you have to do that because nobody from Paris is going to come here. People from Bonn aren't, that's not going to think about the same things. You, you, we have to go with that. Now, the Le, Lufthansa thing, for example, it's a, the deal was signed uh, last month or so that Lufthansa is going to have now non stop flights from St. Louis to Frankfurt. So you say, well, that's, what is that? But it does a whole lot of stuff. Bayer, because Monsanto was put in front of Bayer, Bayer 
measures the border area being significant. significant group of people in Frankfurt. They'll be back and forth and back and forth. But having that nonstop flight for the first time in the last year to a European city is a big thing for us. Um, we're going to work on some more to see if we can get uh, other other um, airlines, international airlines, to fly uh, to destinations from their capitals. It's a big thing that that opportunity for you guys um, so much out along those lines the, the theme of this month of IV activities is the value of diversity Could you talk a little bit about the diversity that on the teams the challenges that you had and the value that you found in that diverse input viewpoints outlooks and experiences so the world is, is much different uh, now than it was. Um, it, it's changing and evolving um, with gender, uh, struggling for gender equality, struggling for racial equality. Now, um, the world has a history of this. The U.S. has its own history that we're, we're working on. But I think that um, having, having a government, for example, that represents the is a good thing. That's a good thing. I think we're, we're learning, we're learning the lesson that the more different the more views and life experiences, hopefully the better the product is. I think that's not an easy thing. Um, it, it, I think it requires, um, apparently requires a great deal of time since nobody's been working with this. It's an effort. Um, as I look at it, I teach at the law school that I just moved. As I look out at the class, um, it's so different than what my class. And computers. Um, but but the, the, the makeup of the class, I think there were um, maybe four African Americans in my law school class, maybe five or six women. Um, now it's just totally different. I can say Ireland, um, which you would think is a totally homogeneous country of white folks has really changed dramatically because of the immigration policies um, that took the migrants uh, that pushed through. So in, in Ireland, if you went to a factory these days or to an office, you, you would expect that you would find Bridget's and Jameson's um, all over. And you're not. You're going to find a huge number of Lithuanians, for example, because Lithuania is a economy of those. The number of Poles that have moved from um, Poland into Ireland because the Polish economy was hanging in the Irish economy. And that's changed Ireland. Um, you know, they, they have now become, it's helped them in their globalization efforts. It's, it, you, can't, you can't be blind to the world when the person sitting next to you is from the world. It just can't, it just can't happen. And that's very good. I have a couple more questions for you, and we'll open it up to questions either for our people in Zoom or here in the room. Um, the uh, the skill set needed to succeed on the global stage is kind of a two prong question. So, with the, the increased tensions in Ukraine, we probably saw the news today that overnight things are not going so well in Ukraine. Uh, but a global mindset is what we try to teach in many of our courses here at the university. And so talk a little bit about two things. One, the mindset that students need to succeed, and then your views on the tensions in Ukraine and the challenges in Hong Kong and Taiwan and China. So a double barrel question sure. to end things here, but what do we need to succeed? You, you need information. Yeah, I, I did an interview this morning on radio about the Ukraine. 
and, and, and said that to make sense of all this, you need to know a couple of things. One is you need to know history. We're just repeating the same stuff over and over and over. And you need to know that. You want to understand the Ukraine, you need to know the history of the Ukrainian government. Well, first of all, how, how Ukraine was part of Russia, and then the Soviet Union. And then the, the, the coup in 2014, which threw out one government, put in the third government. You need to know some geography. Borders make a difference. Who's next to who um, makes, it, makes a difference in your neighborhood, and it makes a difference in the neighborhood. Russia shares a border with Ukraine. Russia is always been paranoid about having its borders exposed after the Nazis came through. Some devastation in Eastern Russia has been always had a border control. NATO has taken that away because of, of the whole point of NATO and the Czech Republic trying to tell us to occupy. So they, they've got that part of the border exposed in Ukraine. They're not a part of NATO, but some of the NATO is not a part of NATO. I, I don't think that you can be successful. I really don't. In the international context, if you're not reading, Journal or Times or online or whatever, wherever you need to be informed about what's going on. People outside the U.S. know what we're doing. We're the big guy on the planet. We're our book is big enough. People follow us, and we need to we need to have some familiarity with what's going on. And I think that's I think that's important. Out of your day, you have access to information. Loading is it's, it's more profound every day, and it can probably is frustrating because you can't keep up with all of it. But you can't, but you just find a pocket of it that you can do. And you know, The Economist magazine is an example for selling that, but that's a, that's a good way of keeping up on things. So just, you just need to know that. Um, and then, obviously, to be good at your field, whatever that's going to be, try to find ways that that makes sense internationally. That's what advisors are for. You can't, the students can't be expected to know that for the next advisor. Should, and if they don't, they'll just say, they find it right. But what, what did you, your marketing niche, where can you, uh, you're a marketing person, where does that make sense in this? This, this group of people. Um, I, I think that it, it doesn't rise in our group, generalized in our head. So you know, have to learn the name, even though the plan may not be what you're hoping to happen in a certain time span. My own life has changed. But, but the planning part is important. So we'll open it up to questions here from the audience here, as well as. Our participants in Zoom. So, so questions for Ambassador O'Malley from the, the room here. Yeah, Wesley. So, in your uh, meeting house over in Ireland, uh, you said you had uh, maybe like hundreds of guests. Uh, um, what is there any particular meetings that you found meaningful? Uh, any times that really stuck out to you? So, we had, um, I would say, my best partner. Um, was, this is sort of funny coming from a democratic movement from a liberal democratic point of view. So President Obama is considered a liberal Democrat. My best partner in Ireland was the American Chamber of Commerce. Um, those people were, uh, they were so in tune to putting American companies to the game. So American companies succeeded in Ireland. And in also helping reverse Irish companies work in the US. So we would have the American Chamber of Commerce and you know, representatives of the 700 American companies uh, there go over a lot to try to get them talking with one another and with Irish businesses and members of Irish government. Um, I had a I bought a work with the You get you know, no invitation gets refused. So we called up uh, and said, you know, um, 
I had the Irish Supreme Court over one time for breakfast. Um, at the Irish Irish Supreme Court as a lawyer, uh, you know, that way. But I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to. My message, my message to the Irish Supreme Court was, you folks are doing a great job for your country by making quick and clear decisions on business disputes. Okay? I'm not talking about did you rule for the plaintiff or did you rule for the defendant? That was none of my business. But I can say as an American looking at American business, what do we want to know? What American businesses want to know is certainty. And as long as the Irish Supreme Court was certain and clear, and they were clear, then American businesses will they'll figure it out. That's up to them to figure out how much risk they want, how much reward they want. So those are the kinds of things that you can do um, you know, by, by having them go over and just having a dialogue. I wanted to tell the Irish Supreme Court, thank you for no no decision. I wasn't trying to there you know, were no big decisions discussed. It was just the process that they did was good for American business in Ireland. That was good for both sides. So those are the kind of those are the kind of things that you do. Um, and there's part of the Fourth of July. Every American ambassador in Ireland has a party on the Fourth of July. Our, our national event, um, because of the the property that you saw there, we had 3,500 people over the Fourth of July, and we would. My idea was to make it look like what what would you see if you were in America if you were in America on the Fourth of July. So we've got hot dogs and hamburgers and Budweiser beer and uh, yeah, uh, the arch. Uh, we, we would have that sort of thing for the guests all over the grounds, um, spreading goodwill about about some things. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, you may you might have talked about this earlier, so. Uh, if it's going to be a sort of repetition, but I'm sorry if you just keep up just a minute. I said that you may have addressed this earlier on, yeah. and I apologize for this, but I'm just interested in knowing what your most challenging, what was most challenging, you know, um, during your your career and your role as an ambassador, and how has that influenced your approach? to community engagement, um, especially in terms of um, international business? Because Ireland, because Ireland and the United States share so many similarities. I mean, the Irish foreign policy and American foreign policy is pretty much in sync, other than as it relates to Palestine and Israel. Uh, where the, the, the Irish traditionally go back the underdog will back the oppressed, they identify with that from the way the British treated them. Um, so they identify with the Palestinians where American foreign policy is influenced. But the biggest challenge, the, the, the hardest thing was actually not governmental, it was personal, in that uh, in my first year, my first year in Ireland as a pastor, the number of Irish students who were exchange students in the US. I, I, there's a program called the J1 program that you may be familiar with. It allows foreign students to come to the US and stay for like six months, do some study, do some work, mostly do some study, work, and play, mostly play. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a number of Irish students were, uh, were in Berkeley, and six of them died. They were standing on a balcony on a 21st birthday, right? and the balcony collapsed, and they died. Um, Ireland is a, is a small country, four and a half million people. Family is the, is the coin of the realm. That is the most important thing to an Irish person is family. So everybody knew somebody who was in that J1 class, and many people knew one of the, the families of one of the six students. So I, we worked to make sure the bodies got back um, quickly. And I attended each of the six funeral masses. And, and it, it was just a, a, some that were two in the day. And, and as an American ambassador, you know, I talked to the parents and the other students. 
it was just uh, we did we, we dedicated a, we, we engraved a stone with this with a quote from James Joyce, an Irish writer, uh, on the embassy grounds in 1906. All so that so I mean. I, it wasn't a personal government. It wasn't a governmental tragedy. It was that personal going through, going through the talking to the parents, um, and it, it reinforced to me what I, what I knew from you know, family in Ireland. So the biggest thing: if you can open, you can open up a, a business in Ireland that will employ ten people. You'll have the prime minister of the country. They understand that jobs need stability in stable neighborhoods, communities, stable cities, stable government. They, they understand that the selling of That's in line with one of the questions that we have from, from Barb Ribbons. Hi, Barb. She's one of our partners in the consortium that we're part of. Where is Barb? I don't know. She is in oh, Zoom. Oh, yeah. yeah. In cyberspace. Okay. Yeah. yeah, she's. she's so um, she, you mentioned how important the family is in Irish culture, and so her question is: share some more insights about the Irish culture, but most important, what surprised you when you got to know the Irish? So the the thing that was surprising, the most surprising thing, occurred almost every day. I was, my wife and I would giggle about. The reception we got everywhere we went was it was phenomenal. We we drove we drove into a small town called Roscommon in the central part of uh, central part of Ireland. And I was to give a speech there and, and to do some ceremony. And as, as we pulled in, um, you know, the limousine and the chauffeur and the people as well. As we we're pulling in um, to this town, they had taken the kids out of school, put them on the sidewalk, all holding American flags, and a band playing. Uh, and you know, we hadn't done it; we just showed up. Uh, the Irish people are just they treat us like they treat all Americans. If you ever go to Ireland, and I hope you all do, uh, you will find that we have we kind of gone home. They're good hosts, no matter what. They treat everybody from every country well, but they treat Americans better than them, right? Because <laughs> for the simple reason, you cannot find anybody in Ireland to be difficult with someone who doesn't have a close relative who's living in the United States. And if they're living in the United States, that means they've been successful. They first couple they came back back. So they view America as sort of the promised land. Because this is where, I mean, when I was when I was in my, my first speech in Ireland, the person who introduced me had done a whole lot of research on me, which was a little scary, but I I was getting used to it. He said, So, Ambassador, your you your family came to the United States in 1910. They gave me the original manifest from this ship that my grandfather listing their names, my oldest aunts and uncles had seven children, and that their possessions, which they translated into this language. Your grandparents came with 20 bucks, seven kids in 1910. My grandfather was in the uh, They were just, they were on Westport, County Mayo, West Coast of Ireland, starving. They came to be with us. And they said, and so in only two generations, your family went from economic refugees to the personal representative of the president of the country that gave them up. The great country. They, they look at us as, we forget to look at ourselves as uh, what opportunities we have by planning uh, is there's so much opportunity available in this country to you because of 
what are my parents, your parents, your grandparents, my grandparents have done. They've given us an awful lot, and we have an opportunity to do So, I mean, that's a long way of what that was my every every place we went, we were treated down because of the way they, the Irish feel about the US, which reinforced my own feelings about my country, of what, what a great country it is. Good questions from anyone in the room? Looks like we've answered them for our Zoom guests. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, actually, go ahead. Make the question easier. Um, and the, the question that I have is, is there an educational experience that you had post-graduation? That you wish you would have followed up or had that experience during your education. Good to meet you. Um, you know, I think once I mean an educational program I learned about after after I entered the workforce. No, I, I, I can't I can't think of any I, there are some things I would have done in my own education differently, but that's not what you that's not what you asked. Uh, with with the with the advantage of a rearview mirror, I, I probably would have studied economics a little bit harder. Uh, uh, but anyway, that is a little bit. Um, no, I think that you know I was part of. I have taught in various. Uh, I'm not a teacher by trade. I'm a travel principal. Is what I what I do my whole life. Um, but I've always been had a put in academia somewhere along the way. And I, I, I taught in Russia, for example, for a while. Um, and and I, I think kind of keeping up with those sorts of things. Uh, and, and although I was listed as a teacher and I was teaching, I was asked me to teach about American trials. How does that work? How do we resolve conflicts, um, business conflicts or personal conflicts without, without uh, in our court systems? Um, yeah, I was. A teacher, but I also learned a lot uh, as I was going through Russia. And, and I was actually one of the places I was at teaching uh, in the late 90s was just about where these Russian troops were stationed uh, in Ukraine. I think I, I learned so much by just exposing myself to that. Uh, was it was difficult to shut down the, my practice for a couple of weeks and, and get ready for it, then move over and then teach and then come back. Uh, but by exposing myself to that, I, and, you know, we all have opportunities like that. You kind of get, get plugged in. You're, just, you're hanging around with people who are curious, and that makes you curious. And then I think that adds to your, your knowledge and your skill set. That answers the question. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any other questions? So, throughout the morning, I know you've mentioned a couple of times uh, through your different stories, it's like hardship and conflict are kind of always present, regardless of whether you're a lawyer or ambassador as you move through a career. So, in the context of your career, I guess, is there any advice you give us as we begin our plan to try to start the planning process where our career might take us? Trying to factor in all these factors that can't be known, especially in the context of like Ukrainian and Russian conflict today, and maybe so with the Irish um, tragedy and stuff like that. Like, how do you kind of work through those, knowing that it's always kind of on the horizon? I, I think that um, I think I would say this. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think. As I look back, I answer your question. As I look back, life looks different to me in my 70s than it did when I was in my 20s. I would say that my, my thought about your question is that life is a long term. And, um, and, and there, everybody gets curveballs. I mean, this. I, I, when I read these stories about people that say they're Americans and Republicans and Nazis, I don't think that's true. Everybody says that. But it's, it, it, that's just the way this is. Uh, I, you just can't let it stop you. You, know, you, you, you might refine your plan, uh, you might abandon your plan, but most likely you're just going to 
find it, but you just don't stop. Um, these things pass. Uh, if, if, you, if you're talented and you identified your spot, um, you, there will be people who don't want you to succeed for some other reason. Maybe it's not personal reasons, too. Maybe they just they want they want to be where you want to be, and so there's competition for that one spot. Uh, maybe or, may, or maybe for somebody that doesn't like you and they want to bump you off from your career plan. Doesn't happen very often, but I just think you can just it, it's a it's a matter of determining that you're going to go forward and not blindly because you may have to modify some things in your mind, but not. Everybody wants to get hired. Um, well, the world's against you. We all have those thoughts. But the world really isn't against you. It just looks that way. So sometimes. And you just, you just, you know, hustle on. I, that's sort of a big answer. Yeah, so thank you. And I think that's a, it's a great way to, to end this session. And thank you so much, Ambassador Malik. My pleasure. Your inspiration and your time that you spent with us. Thank you very much. So that's our second to last session for this month of Ivy events. So we have another panel starting today at 11 o'clock entitled She Rocks, which has uh, uh, some great female international business executives. And that session will be in Zoom. And so I hope that those of you who are here can, can log in to see that and our, our Participants in Zoom and on Facebook will be able to join that as well. So thank you for everybody. Oops, I'm sorry, Dean Joan Phillips. Can, can we get a, pe a picture with uh, Ambassador Malady and all the students and staff who are oh, our absolutely. Yeah. Our yeah. Ambassador, would you be sure, okay sure, with sure. that? Of course, of course, of course. All right. That's a great idea. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who was on Zoom. I'm going to go ahead and end the session now, and hopefully we'll see you at 11 o'clock. Thank you so much. I mean, I have a camera. Okay. Who's <laughs> 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 the professional? He's out.